can you can hear me now? Okay, good. So first, my, my purpose of this talk is not to tell you anything you already don't know about medicine in the medical field, but trying to relay my experience in terms of how technology evolved in, 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 in my industry that I experience with and see how that can carry over to what you experience is now, which is great changes. Okay, so first I want to give a little history. Because the history will set the context for all the change that I faced in my 30 somewhat years career, right? But one thing I always start with is when I started, my mom, when I was a poor family, my mom always told me, always follow your passion and never stop learning, right? That's something I've carried with me since I was a very little, small child, and it's very relevant to what I will talk about today. So you think, you know, I'm, I'm a tech guy, geek guy, but I actually as an artist, my background. Art for me is what drives me every day, something creative, something visual, and that's my background. So which led me to my only experience in the, want to be in the medical field, I wanted to be a medical illustrator when I was in 10th grade. And these are drawings from my 10th grade class as a kid. So I just fell in love with the work that, you know, I was seeing in, in books and things like that, and I just loved the science and the technology and the art all combined together. And I went as far as I painted a mural in a bank in New York City in, in 1977. So I, I was really heavily into the art field when I was young, but with a severe interest in technology. And particularly, I fell in love with the, this thing called the computer in the 70s. I actually built my first computer in 1976, and my first experience with computer actually breaking to a lab at a school to learn about computing. But for me, I had this fortunate experience of being in the right place at the right time. I have the passion for art, but I sort of happened to be there when the computer, personal computer got invented. So when I graduated from college, originally I wanted to be in biomedical engineering, but it turns out what I wanted to do in 1979 was impossible. I wanted to use optical system to separate DNA. Turns out it was 20 years ahead of where the industry was. And that, my advice at school told me to drop out. So I ended up getting a job at HP in the RF and microwave lab. Yeah, in fact, when I received my Distinguished Alumni Award, I got up and said, I hope you guys know I dropped out of grad school. And the dean almost fell over. So in 1980, early 80s, the three of, three of us in Silicon Valley started a company called PEI. And this is a very, very typical Silicon Valley type startup, right? A bunch of kids, know nothing about anything, trying to do something that never been done before. So we decided we love computer and we love to make picture. So we're going to use computer to make picture. But at that point, none of the technology existed. You just have to invent everything, right? Hiring a group of people, a small group of people, and they're very talented people. And in, in fact, uh, this is some picture of the early days back in 85. In fact, that picture on the right, the 23 people, the 16 Academy Award in that 23 people. It's quite a group of amazing group of people we found it early on. And so that's the startup. You guys know about startup. I won't get too much into that. But one thing I want to look at is how an industry goes through a life cycle, right? And you would say, hey, you, you're in one of these new fangled visual computer graphics thing. How can it be a life cycle? And actually, in fact, we have gone through a life cycle. And it was amazing how quickly we went through it and how it caught us all off guard. The lesson I learned from that, you know, I built a successful company, and actually after that I built a failed company. But through that experience, I, this is what I'm learning recently. That industry goes through these life cycles, and particularly in today, we go through them much more quickly, right? You, you go through this initial phase of you, in, you sort of introduce some new idea and you hit the ground, you get some traction, you grow and then mature and then it go, goes away. In the past, you know, we deal with a lot of these revolution, no, revolutionary cycle in the industry, right? You have the industrial revolution, mass production, you know, the technology revolution, communication, transportation, and you know, so I sort of were there at the right time of the digital revolution, but recently now you're going through this, you know, a AI machine learning process, and it's going to have dramatic impact on everything. So, 
And now I will want to take you through my personal li life cycle in the technology field I was in. Right? We started out by sort of gotten to a point where we actually oh, sort of changed the, the media industry. Right? The media industry, when we got started in the early 80s, um, was really the film and video industry. Nothing was digital, everything was fairly analog, and people were still doing everything on film, editors cutting film, you didn't have the, you know, vid people weren't really editing digital at that point. And then when we came along, we created the digital media world. We created computer animation, we developed the technology of software, and then the media industry went from film to digital, went to CD to DVD through the 90s. And now we've gone through the change where we've gone through to the online media, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, last night I was talking to, you know, ver various people, in include Howard Rosen, who's from LifeWire. He used to be in the film industry as well, but he was smart enough to get out sooner than I did and, you know, have a very successful, you know, it, uh, business now in the, in the medical field. So I will go through sort of that, uh, my journey and the lesson we learned through that, right? So a little bit of background and the journey we did, right? When we first came on board, we completely disrupted the television graphics industry. It used to be all film, stop motion graphics and all that. We went and converted digital. So we were very successful. On Monday night back in 1985, 86, you turn on TV exactly 9 p.m. We had work on ABC, NBC, CBS, HBO, VH1, Cinemax. So we basically dominated the television graphics industry by completely disrupting it. So in, in today's term, you would say we pulled the Uber on the traditional industry, right? And I think that's the type of disruption that I'm finally becoming, learning to understand better how that happens, right? And we did many things, right? I had a chance to actually, I personally designed a Monday Night Football opening. So that was my proud moment. I said, hey, you know, something, something different. But we also invented many things, right? Before I invented a system for doing facial animation, traditional animation were not done on the computer. So we actually built a 3D f character animation system. This was actually the first character we animated in 3D for a Japanese commercial. Tools like that, technology like that didn't exist. So you sort of get into this row where you say, hey, I'm going to invent things, right? We did the first CG animated TV show. Working with, that's a Bill Hanna from Hanna-Barbera. If you're old enough to remember that. So we did the first ever TV show with animated character, right? So a lot of firsts. You get in this row and you invent things. You know, we did a lot of television and film work. You know, we start doing visual effects. I mean, personally, I've visual effects supervised 16 Hollywood motion picture. And, and so we felt like, God, we, this is unstoppable. We can do all this stuff. But little do I know how wrong we were. Because as much as we were successful in doing all this, the world was changing around us, right? Even though we came in and disrupted the industry, we thought, God, you know, this can go on forever. We were wrong, but we didn't know it, right? We also worked with Jim Henson. We did the first... Uh, real-time puppeteering in CG. This was Jim Henson be right before he passed away. Right? We developed original technology for that. I supervised the first ever digital human in the film. This was with Batman f forever in the early 90s. And this was the first time we actually recreate a full-body digital human in the film. Because of my background in human anatomy, I love this stuff, right? This was great. You know, so sort of like mixing my interest now back into the world I was in. But again, that's something, you know, then we moved on, we made the first Academy animated film. But then in 2002, we closed a lot of our business. It didn't make sense anymore. But, whoop, sleep mode, that's weird. Oh, something has to log in. It logged me out. No, it's, it's in sleep mode. Somebody has to log in here. So we, we, th we thought, like, everything was going great, but then the business saw sort of went away, and we didn't really know why. Even though we were successful, we... Things we took for granted didn't go the way we thought it would. Even though we were on the top of the field, 
we didn't see what was changing. And that, I think that took me many years later on to realize that. You know, then the studio still remained successful. We, you know, we made a lot of big film. You guys probably seen most of those. And the other thing I did, I took the company global. I went and convinced Jeffrey Kassenberg that we should not only do things in the States, but learn, the world was changing. I seen that this is in the early 2000s that the media field now should expand globally. So I convinced the studio and we actually went global. We set up a television project that I set up and we did the production in, uh, this one was in Hong Kong. Also I set up DreamWorks operation in India because I was really intrigued by that globalization, not in the traditional sense, right? In the traditional sense, globalization is you sort of find cheap labor out there. But my motto is globalization is bring your business over there so they can be successful over there. And we were way ahead of the game, but it's a lot of stuff that we miss. So finally in 2008, I got so frustrated by the whole process that I left Hollywood, right? I said, okay, this is no longer makes sense to me. So how can I take this understanding and move on to other places? So I started a new startup, trying to connect people around the world, you know, sort of like what teleconferencing and telemedicine is, connect artists around the world, how they can work together. And unfortunately, we picked the wrong path. In 2008, the world was going down to the cloud solution. We went to the peer-to-peer -peer solution. So that, I, you know, that's another talk altogether. So after that, in fact, the studio got completely closed down in 2015, right? The world was completely changing. And as these events were happening, I was caught off guard. I said, what did I miss? What is changing that I didn't see? And it turns out there were many things that were changing, right? Like studios were going away left and right. There were a lot of studio that, so a big studio, they were all disappearing, right? And it wasn't the technology. I mean, here's a chart of the technology change from when we started to 2012. It grew exponentially, right? That's a logarithmic, you know, chart there. So it wasn't the technology. It was our understanding of how the market was changing, right? And that was a big issue that, you know, I wish we had the foresight to be able to understand that change ahead of it, but we didn't. So for one thing is the media platform originally went from a content management system where you know who, when, and what. You know, you went to a bunch of people went to the movie this weekend. We had a box office of $10 million. So that was a very clear cut. That's how we understood the market, right? That's told us Hollywood forever. But as the digital age came along with social network and big data came along, we now have understand identity, community, ecosystem. And the industry we were in didn't catch on to that until it was too late, right? And so you see the Hollywood now is really suffering. The online medium like Netflix and Amazon has really made an inroad because they understand the big data, right? Hollywood did not understand big data. I still never forget the day that when we were releasing one of the Shrek movie, somebody posted a Shrek trailer on YouTube and our lawyer actually went out and had them take it down. Right? The fact that that medium is a free publicity, we didn't understand that. We had lawyer going taking down stuff that helped promote our film. Right? That's how much we miss the market that changes that was in front of us. And now with the new machine learning space and all that, and now you understand social, and social behavior of your audience. Right? No different than in the medical world, you will now understand behavior of, of your patient, you can predict things much more accurately, right? I think that, that are, those are all the changes that were there, but we were so embedded in our space. And in, in the past, you know, movie makes studio where you had ideas, you go to a producer, studio, distributor, marketing, and you get to the consumer, right? But along come people like Netflix and YouTube and Hulu and so forth. Now you connect the idea to the consumer. And that's the space you guys are in, right? Telemedicine now, brings the doctor to the patient without that barrier in between. So I see a lot of similarity there. But I think fortunately for you guys, you ha you're, you're at the point you actually can see that happening a lot sooner than we did, right? And back then, the other thing too is budget, right? We, we, we didn't understand the mechanics of the economics of this change. 
It's easy to sit in Hollywood and just say, yeah, yeah, we made $10 million on this film, this, this, this release. But, and then, but the economic turns out changed a lot. Right? In feature film, we made film at a mil over a million dollar per minute. That's the gauge of metric. But in recent years, what I learned is to really to be competitive in the mobile space, you had to be at thousand dollar per minute, right? That's not like a little bit better. That's like a thousand times better, right? If I walk up to anybody or an engineer, I say, I want you to make this twice as good. They'll go, no problem, I'll get that done, right? If I come up to a startup and I say, we're going to be 10 times as good, we're going to really change the industry. But now I have faced the challenge in the media field of how do we get a thousand times better, right? And you would say that's ridiculous, right? But it turns out it's not. The problem was we did not look at all our flaws. We only looked at our strength, but not looking at our weakness. Now in retrospect, looking back at all the weakness we have, we didn't understand the business model, we didn't have the right tool set. We were using tools that were 30 years old, okay? And it turns out that really hampered us. And you really have to be very open-minded when you face these changes, right? You don't go and say, hey, I've been doing this really well for so long. I'm going to take this and make it work in this new space. You have to question everything, right? And then what, what happened is then, after that, that I, when I saw that happening, I went, and went out and did things to try to challenge all that, right? One of the things... I did was I went out into Asia and start running all these different business and start all these different business. I ran a studio in, in, in Taiwan that did the animated news. You, you guys probably seen that Tiger Wood animated news story that's sort of funny. There's a studio in Taiwan that did this. It's owned by one of the biggest newspaper com studio, uh, company in Asia. And they wanted to sort of revitalize their the, the studio. So I went out there and I became CEO for, for a few years. And they're the one who take a news story that breaks at, like, say, on, on the hour, and they'll be out on the air with a full animated news story in two hours, right? In Hollywood, we can't even have a meeting in two hours. <laughs> they're going from story to finished product in two hours, right? And that's when I realized, how can that happen? That's why I took this job. I say, I want to really understand. So what I found out was they had people that didn't have the baggage we had, right? To really disrupt the industry, it's easier to come in clean. But for all of you that have been in the medical industry, you need to come in and learn to put your baggage aside, put your old ideas out, leave it outside, and think differently. So, you know, I, I went there and I created all these mobile content for very low cost. We create content for mobile, new story every day, right? But once you start creating new things every day, you change the landscape completely, right? It's no longer, well, let's sit on this, rewrite this script for millions of dollars for years and months, right? Hollywood film, six years to make, right? Uh, I remember the, uh, Kung Fu Panda, the first one, took six years to produce. And that's an infinite amount of time in the mobile space. So we need to think completely differently. So we were creating content that are new every day. I would sit there with a production team, would come up, I was creative producer, one of these, and every day we would come up with new ideas and it get produced, and which completely proved that you can do that. And we actually went as far to try to see how low we can lower the cost. We actually created real-time animated news story. We created a whole pipeline using Game Engine. We can, in real-time, deliver CG character during a live show. I mean, this actually is very innovative, even back in 2014. We would monitor the hashtag of the feedback. We were streaming a live show from Taiwan to Japan, and we would monitor the hashtag, the feedback, and this performer who's in motion capture suit would watch a teleprompter with the writer updating the script, right? This is the brave new world. A and the, even in U.S., they, they haven't caught on to this yet, right? But we were doing this back in 2014. And... So to really innovate, you have to really take all your bad habits and throw it out the door, right? If I have carried all my experience into this new field, I will have failed for sure. Because all the way I'm used to doing things would not have worked here. And this really requires uh, us to get everybody to go, okay, let's step back, and if we can do this, how can we do it without the knowledge we have, right? I'm not going to... 
I'm going to skip ahead here. Then also the last few years, I also spent a lot of time doing work in AR and VR, right? You guys hear a lot of the buzz about that, and I think there's a lot of good application for a lot of these area, but I won't get into that here. But I spent a lot of time building a company that actually done a lot of AR and VR work. This is some of the work we've done. And, but what I'm seeing too is a lot of AR and VR studio, because a lot of people who lost their job in my traditional industry, digital, content industry went to the AR VR space. But uh, having visited most of them, the question I get at the end of almost every visit is, Richard, what do you think is our business model? Right? Because they carry their old habit into this new space and the business model doesn't work. Right? When you're used to producing film at a million dollar per minute and you try to bring into this new content space, it's not going to add up. So they had to really rethink that. So I also did a design an app using Pixar character for a museum. That was a very interesting experience, but I won't get into that too much. And uh, so, just to quickly, because I I can talk about this stuff all all day long. But the thing, what I learned is you really have to evolve. Evol evolving is not just like becoming better, but really change to change your whole image of what the world needs to be to really make this dis disruptive change. And I, I was now my back of mind is always this 1,000 time change, right? I'm looking at every industry I'm looking at, I'm going, how can it be a 1,000 time? And it turns out it's not as hard as you think if you step far enough away to look at it. And new tool, new process, that's very important. Because we in the film industry, we're still using a lot of tools that are 30 years old and it's really hard to make these major leap during that. And I'm used to a, a space where we do a lot of creative thinking, combining art and science. And I think it's true for any industry as well. Okay. So talk about new tools, right? Then the new thing people talk about nowadays is big data, right? And you guys in the medical field are good at collecting a lot of data. But one thing I learned, because I spent a lot of time in the data analytic field in the last couple of years, uh, particularly in the machine learning space, working with uh, uh, ACM, SIGGRAPH, and a few startup company. And very important thing is good data. Right? I have a friend who does a startup company doing analytic big data mining for a uh, nonprofit company. And it turns out if you have bad data, it's totally worthless. So if one thing to really etch in your mind, if you're going to build any new adventure, make sure you collect good valid data. data. Right, because I, I was looking at a data set just recently. Of the 65,000 record I look at, 15,000 were erroneous. Right, you're not going to make good decision on data that's bad. And it turns out a lot of old historical data, unless you're dealing with x-ray or something that's very objective, could have been entered erroneously and you didn't have the error checking in place, you go look at it now. So just be aware of that pitfall. And machine learning is really the big thing now, right? I don't never use the word AI because I really don't think that's intelligent at this point. But really machine learning is, is, a, is a tool set that we all need to learn to use, right? Uh, last yesterday morning I was at Intellectual Venture Lab up in Bellevue, Washington. It's one of the biggest research labs for new technology in, in the world. And they have all these new technology. They have a classification system for identifying malaria from, you know, uh, slides is far superior to any human, right? So pretty much you can say all classification job in the medical field or any field is going to disappear in the near term because machine learning will totally do the better job. But it's not in all cases, right? I mean, I was talking to Google people about the machine uh, translation system, right? And it turns out it's, they do a lot of things that they thought were right, but it turns out they were wrong because they were looking at all the best translation they did in the past, assumed that was correct, so they end up wiping out a lot of languages by throwing out bad translation, right? So you have to be really cautious that what data you have and what you use it for. It's a tool, it's not a replacement for thinking, right? The intelligence is not there. A lot of people say, oh, hey, you know, computer machine learning will replace artists. Well, it's going to replace some artists doing the grunt work, but it's not going to replace the artist who's creative, right? And also the learning process accelerating. That's one thing we all have to get used to. Anything you do now, you have to do it in a much faster pace, which is something that you go, wait, wait, I'm, I'm already slow, right? I'm, I'm, I'm a slow guy. 
And but turns out you learn to use these tools to help accelerate your learning, right? I'm, I, right now, all, all, I'm, when I'm traveling, I travel a lot. My tablet's always full of digital uh, online classes that I'm learning from. I'm constantly learning. Let's go back to my first slide. What my mom tell me told me is never stop learning, right? And the other thing you have to think about now is you can't do it alone. You have to encompass other people involved in your process. You have to be very open, you know, open source, open platform. But you also you have to be secure, right? When I built my startup to do connecting people, it was totally about security. But it turns out to really do it right now, that you have to be fully open, but yet fully secure. It might, they seem to be a dichotomy there, but I think it can be done. All right. And, and one thing, one, one thought is, right, in any industry over time, it, it evolves to build a mechanism to protect itself, right? Like human, you know, this is a crowd that totally built, probably I don't have to, you know, raise the question of do you believe in evolution or not. In evolution, we all develop, any system will develop a system to protect itself. But also we also know that in evolution system, once in a while it takes these major jump that disrupt everything. And sometimes we have resistance to change, and in my experience, we, Hollywood failed to follow the change because we built a mechanism, protective mechanism, that hid, that hide the reality, hidden the re made the reality hidden from us. So in, in business, you know, you have to be creative, efficient, global, connected, and smart. I won't get into that. That's very obvious. But I'll, I'll end with a slide from what I took from the newsstand at the airport when I was flying down from Seattle yesterday, right? On here is there's some very relevant things, right? Obviously, on the one side it says go big. On the bottom it says overcommitted organization, right? Because you have to move fast and quick in, in this new world. You, can, you want to go big, but it's really to be overcommitted. And then the other side up in the corner is the tech panic of 2017. And, uh, and that's actually interesting what happened this year, right? There's a huge amount of security breach in many areas like Equifax, you know, the Hollywood studio and so forth. So those are a big issue. The tech industry now is facing a lot of challenges. Part of it because they carry too much history with them. A lot of these systems fail because they're old systems. Right, they didn't go back and go like the world has changed. Well, how will t things be different? Right, the bank are facing the whole issue of you know blockchain for currency, right, cryptocurrency, right, how you store data, that's changing. But the real message here, though, is the one on the Time magazine, right? The storm gets to keep getting stronger, and so do we, right? If you keep learning and you keep moving forward. You can take on these storms that are, you know, stirring up the world. So hopefully, you know, from what I learned, the mistake I made, it will help inspire you to move forward and be able to adapt to these changes. And I, especially in the medical field, I'm going to learn so much from you guys. So thank you. I was just, uh, what well, this was so interesting and, and thank you for uh, an amazing topic, something that I uh, really never uh, understood and I never had the, the, the insight that you've provided by watching most of those movies, certainly. Um, but what was your connection with DreamWorks? Was that, were you working for DreamWorks no, or they, just they participating bought my studio. in the project? Oh, I see. Yeah, because okay. DreamWorks didn't have digital animation technology. So we had a studio up here and they bought us and well, at first they resisted using it. At the end, our technology became the core of all the movies. All the movies were made from software we helped create it. So they updated that software at some point? Excuse me? Uh, yes, but that's a not whole, whole another story altogether. Story altogether, right? Yeah, they, right. Thank, they, thank we, you. we've created most of the software with just a handful of people. They mm -hmm. they had two hundred people at some point working on the software, and believe me, software is not about how many people you have. It's really how it's really about you know having the right people understand the passion of what it takes to get it done. So.
So in this continuous working and learning, how do you put yourself and family together? Excuse me? In this busy world where you're always working and learning, how you put the family together, how much you get the time for the family? Oh, that's interesting. Actually, I was one of the first visual effects supervisors to use video conferencing. I used a, a polycom had a video conferencing system over a dial-up phone. I used to do visual effects supervising. I'm traveling away from home a lot. And that's actually my daughter is here today. Uh, and we used to talk to each other over the you know, dial-up phone video conferencing system. And uh, you, you used to do what you can to stay in touch. And f for me, it's really about your, your family is what ground you. And so I travel a lot. I mean, I, I, I was gone through a time where every other week I would spend two weeks, every two weeks I would be in a different country, right? And uh, I actually hold the record for one of the worst trip in Hollywood. I took a bunch of executive visits in nine countries in 12 days and 30 studio, right? In fact, I'll write a book about that someday. And um, there's a lot of actually interesting culture story to be told in that one journey. For sure, you have a group of Hollywood executive with you. But yeah, it's, I took advantage of the technology. My last company was distributed in nine states. We use VC for communication, not to give him a a plug here, so. Okay, th okay. Um, I think in the interest of time, again, yeah. so Richard will be around. So I'll be around. Again, thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.